it's so important to have space and time for healing because hurt people hurt people. Um, my ex-husband was hurt. I was hurt leaving that marriage. Um, it, it develops into this monster Mm -hmm. that you can't believe is your life. And just thinking, this isn't my story. This happens to other people. This doesn't happen to me. It was something that I had such a such a shroud of shame over me after it happened because I felt like such a failure. Um, over time, I've learned that it isn't something to be ashamed of. And it's certainly a part of my story that I've been able to use to, to help other people. There was finally this message and it was about love. And it was love is patient, love is kind. And I remember thinking, this is not what I'm doing. Like this relationship is not any of these things. It's real pain. Some of the times... You just can't overcome that. Um, Abuse, you know, safety is is definitely a conversation we have a lot, but we just just don't want to play the judgment card because we're not in their shoes. I felt it just wash over me, and I knew that God was with me and He was going to walk with me. Was all of it great and hunky-dory? No. It was gross and awful and painful and like losing a limb. It's like a death, right? But that person is still alive. It's harder because there's no closure in that death because they're there. Also, they can continue hurting you or your children. There are a lot of scriptures out there that that really support um, difficulties in life. And if you're there and you have the right purpose and your heart's in the right place, sometimes you can't avoid separation and divorce. A lot of it really... The root is it gets back to the abuse. Their reality is they're going through divorce. So our job as the church, as the hands and feet of Christ, is just to love them in it. We don't um, discount their hurt. We're going to help them go through a grieving process. Just because I don't believe or agree doesn't mean I can't learn from you. Why did you have to bring that up? (laughs) Okay, that one I'm super embarrassed about. (laughs) Do you like me? Do I like you? Yeah. As, a, as an individual or as yeah, a podcast? Yeah, as a person. No, I like you. Okay, cool. Yeah. cool. And I don't have any interest in appearing to be stronger than I am. I ain't bowed a Nebuchadnezzar statue. He gonna leave. You feel me? How do we love people who see the world differently than we do? What would it look like if we truly loved all of our neighbors? Could listening to their stories be the first step? This is Seacoast Church, and there's way more to talk about. Well, this is great. Three brand new voices to the podcast. And what I'd love to do is just the nature of how we're going to do this conversation. I really think that background is super important. So I would love to just kind of go around and uh, just give me some basics, like where you're from, maybe what kind of hobbies you like, um, if you got an interesting job and you'd like to share what you do, anything you'd like to share. But I did ask y'all, I'll have to tell our listeners five minutes ago. So I, I basically last minute assignment, I said, tell us one thing super interesting about yourself. So yeah, it's kind of like Jeopardy, you know, in Jeopardy when they go in contestants and everybody has something interesting. Sure. All right. So sure. we'll start with you, Scott. All right. Good to have you here. How long have you been a part of Seacoast? Exactly. That's a great question. Great jumping off point. 24 years. <laughs> 24 years. So you, you're uh, more old, old school than me. I am. That's crazy. That's... Well, I'm, I'm older than you, obviously. Right, you right. But, but there's not too many people that have been here longer than me, which is crazy because I, I remember being the new guy. But when I came on here yeah. on staff in 2005, the church was 17 years old. And then here we are. 20, yeah. I mean, yeah. Mount Pleasant campus the whole time for mm-hmm. me. Uh, I, I moved to... Charleston 30 years ago. So I've seen a lot of change from where? In, in the in the area. From Wilmington. Gotcha. I'm a North Carolina kind of guy. Mm-hmm. Big Tar Heel fan. Yeah. Yeah. We That's, can tell by your voice that you're from the South. Yeah. I can yeah. tell we're family, yeah. you know, yeah. just how yeah. we're talking. Yeah. So you don't like the Duke Blue Devils? Not at all. Christian Leitner, Leitner Bobby Hurley, Grant Hill. See how old school I am, basketball? Yeah, you are. Cherokee Parks. God is a Tar Heel. <laughs> yeah, we know that. Hey, Tar but, Heel Blue Sky, right? But, hey, I go old school at UNC. Um, remember Pete Chilcutt, uh, Montross, Hubert Davis. Eric Montross, yeah. Stackhouse, wasn't he on North Carolina? Back there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, oh, and, yeah. And you're a basketball fan. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We're so connected. I'm all, yeah, I'm always pulling for Clemson because that's just my team, but they're hardly ever oh, good no. in the ACC. No, so no. I'm always pulling for 
the ACC. When UNC and Duke match up, I'm usually UNC though. So excellent. Yeah, we're, we couldn't okay. be friends otherwise. Right. Probably we'll have to do some texting during the game. Yeah, so yeah. There yeah. you go. All right. But so another good. interesting thing about yourself. Well, it, you know. I've been divorced twice, and I know that I know that's the topic of today's conversation. No, no, so we're, we're actually talking. That out no, there. we're talking spiritual warfare today. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. great. I'm just yeah, I got to go. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> let's start over then. So, <laughs> you know, um, the the mother of my son they they live in Indiana, um, and he's 21 years old, and and they uh, mean a lot to me, um, and and I I just um, I think about all the folks that are separated from their children, and uh, my son lives many years, many, many hours away from me, and uh, I just wish I could get to see him more often. Uh, my family lives in North Carolina, my mom and dad. I have a girlfriend that lives on James Island over there, and um, beautiful girl. She's been with me for about four years now, and uh, as a career, I started in the airline industry 13 years with um, U.S. Air and Piedmont Airlines. And then I did something really unique. Mm -hmm. I started the South Carolina Aquarium. I was part of that team. Dang. I worked there for five years. Like it was you, all your idea? You're like, no, we're going to start no, an aquarium here. Joe Riley did that. <laughs> that was Joe Riley. Uh, but I was on that team. That's cool. And one of the unique things about that is is the Great Ocean Tank that is downtown, the, the biggest tank that's down there. I can actually say that I stood in that tank before there was any water in there. Nice. That's, so cool. That's a pretty wow. cool nice. experience. Yeah. But then I left there and went into banking and spent uh, 19 years in banking with uh, South Carolina Federal Credit Union nice. as VP of marketing. And then I retired from them. And from there, it's just been a lot of golf, pickleball, and um, uh, traveling, and um, what else? Volunteering for the church. There you go. Uh, leader for divorce care program. I've been doing that for several years with Noel and a lady by the name of Angela. And that's been very rewarding uh, in addition to encourage her program and doing some freedom and rooted classes yeah. as well, leading those. Yeah. So I'll just stop there. That's, you are involved, man. That's you are me. a part of this place, eh? Yeah. All right. And so it's you and stuff. Noel know each other because y'all do. been doing yes. divorce care together? Correct. Yeah. Nice. Tell yeah. us a bit about yourself. Um, I really do feel like a game show host. It's like, you yeah, know, we're going to move uh -huh. on to the speed round, but before Let's we do, do that. Before <laughs> Let's do it. I, um, I have been going to Seco since I was 11. Dang. So I was trying to do the math. I'm not good at math. Uh, I'm 36 now. Oh, <laughs> so you're 25 or uh, no, not 11 years ago. Yeah. I, so you're 36, 11 years old. So 25 yeah. years you've been here. Yeah. Oh, okay. She's yeah. got you beat. Yeah. <laughs> My gosh. Um, Way to go. So I, um, y'all been around long enough then to where the, the do y'all know like the Surratts and like the, the leaders here that have, I mean, cause y'all been around long enough. Cause a lot of people, they start coming to Seacoast and there's just a few opportunities. They're going to run into Pastor Greg. Yeah. But. Yeah. My, um, my interesting fact is, uh, probably that I remember going to Nitro and oh the trailers gosh. when Brandon yeah. Lake was our mm -hmm. like guitar player. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so that's like my cool, that's my cool fact about that. But I, I moved away for 10 years. Uh, my ex-husband was in the Navy. So we lived in Hawaii, Guam, Connecticut, um, Southwest Georgia wow. and Cincinnati. Most recently I moved back two years ago. Um, and then plugged right back into the church. I started with the divorce care program. Uh, my mom, guilted me into going. She was like, just try it. And I was like, mom, if these people just hug me and tell me they love me, I'm going to scream and run off. Them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like I can't. And it was great. It was this whole community of people just loving you through the worst time that no one ever plans on being there. No one. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd grown up in the church my whole life. And uh, I just had an idea about what marriage was and marriage is hard, but you fight for it. Um, and you never want to end up in that room, but it's a great room once right. you get in it yeah. and you find your people and they end up being your biggest cheerleaders and they really help you help carry you through that, through that time. Yeah. So, yeah. So you were, you're the groundswell generation before it was custom. It was yes. groundswell in high school. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, but my, my most vivid memories it's were nitro. nitro trailers. Yeah. Yeah. Nitro yeah. trailers. Yeah. 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 That's funny. Cause I remember going to high school services and I mentioned this to him when he was on the podcast in the first episode of Seacoast podcast, but I'll just never forget. Cause 
you know, I'm looking at this kid playing guitar and I know who he is. I'm like, that's Brandon. Like that's Mac and Cindy's mm-hmm. son. And mm-hmm. it was just so funny because he just couldn't keep looking at the big TV screens that had him on there. And he was just like, yeah, I still like those big TV screens, you know, it's just neat. But just as a little kid, he just kept looking back. He had short hair. And I mean, what's crazy is you could tell at that age, he's shredding. It's like, oh, he's already good. Mm -hmm. Like he's not just playing chords. He's so humble. Mm -hmm. So humble. Just fit in with all the other, like uh, we were all like geeky little Mm -hmm. lanky, weird teenagers just fit right in with everybody. So humble. It was great. I also remember, um, what was that like? It was like a teenage nightclub that was over next to Harris Teeter. Do you remember that? Mm, that was like the warehouse. The, oh, oh, oh. Yes. Um, no, what is it called? What was the, it called? Uh, the, the annex. The yeah. annex. That's yes. it. Called yeah. it for young adults. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they, I, I actually, I'm old school enough to where I taught over there once. I, yeah. I went there mm-hmm. once and I was like, I don't know about this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, and uh, did you? You've already told us a lot of cool stuff. Have you told us the thing that I, I, yeah, I gave you I as an assignment? I, I, I've traveled a lot. Yeah, I got yep, to live a lot of yep, cool places. Yep, Brandon Lake. Yep. Guam or Hawaii? Guam for yeah. sure. Hawaii was like um, Charlotte with a beach. Really? It was like super. <laughs> we lived on the main you just island. Destroyed like, destroyed my Kiki. thoughts of Hawaii. Know, it's always been a place I, I want to go, and in one statement, you're but like, Guam, "Well, maybe not." <laughs> Guam was so cool. It was like 12 miles wide and 30 miles long, and a lot of it's still undeveloped. It's like rainforest, and you could like be hiking and find a World War II plane that's crashed. And you're like, I don't even know if anybody knows yeah. this is here. <laughs> <laughs> I may have discovered this. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so Scott and Noel, y'all know each other yes. and y'all are just meeting Kelly. Correct. Right? Yes, we met out in the lobby. Yep. Yep, and you've been here for a good little while too, but um, not not old school like them. Not old school. So I as it, for Seacoast, I discovered Seacoast in 1994. So however many years yeah. ago that was, that's quite a few years ago. Um, but it wasn't until probably in the last 12 years it's been home for me, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it totally does. So um and and that's a long story I won't even get into right now. But it was my first touch of it was in '94, um, and it was actually Michael Morris who did a follow up phone call with me after I had um, visited. And it, it was like one of those nights where I just needed somebody to call, and he was probably just doing what he had to do, picking up that card and calling. But anyway, it was very uh, instrumental in why I went back and back and back. Um, so yeah, my um, my history is in I grew up in Tennessee. Um, Chattanooga, Tennessee, but my dad was in the Navy, so we moved around all the time too. And I loved Hawaii, so don't yeah. don't give yeah, up, don't yeah. give up okay, on your don't dreams. Don't give up on it. Right. No, no. Um, <laughs> Hawaii was great, uh, but I was five, so my perspective was different than oh, hers. Oh yeah, um, oh yeah. You you probably reflect <laughs> on Hawaii like I see Myrtle Beach as a kid. I was, I mean, it's yeah. the same thing <laughs> from a kid perspective, <laughs> right? But grew up in Tennessee. I actually moved to South Carolina to go to Clemson. Yeah, gotcha, I heard nice. you say you were a Clemson yeah. Clemson fan. Um, went to Clemson because my 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 parents divorced when I was in high school, and so I could go to either a South Carolina school or a Tennessee school. And I just wanted to start fresh. And I actually went to Clemson knowing zero people. That was pretty interesting. But went to nursing school there, um, ended up moving here in Charleston because all of my friends were from Charleston, and I fell in love with the water and just how beautiful it was here. And so I became a nurse at MUSC and worked in the neonatal intensive care areas and then quickly discovered that I loved teaching. So I started becoming a teacher at Trident Tech about 22 years ago. So I've been teaching nursing students for the last 22 years. Nice. Yeah. And I'm about to go full circle. So I'm about to actually retire from the state in a few months and then just go back to part-time at the bedside so that I can spend more time with some other things that I'm wanting yeah. to do. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for a second, I, I, I could use my context clues, but for a second, it sounded like you said that you were nursing students. And I was like, oh, wow, that's pretty crazy. But now you're <laughs> teaching nursing students. Teaching st- nursing <laughs> students. Yes. Yes. Well, I spent a lot of time, I was working at a teaching hospital. And so I would have days where I was just a nurse for, for 12 hours and days that I had students with me from various schools. And I loved those days where yeah. I had somebody to kind of feed into. And so that's why did, I realized I needed to be yeah. a teacher. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. All right. So I'm curious and I, I'll, I'll tell y'all that there's, there's no way that we can adequately go through everybody's story in a, in a way that in, in my opinion, that would be comprehensive enough for people to really understand because you just can't, I mean, you could do a whole podcast series on each of your stories, you know, I mean, cause it's just, it's a, a life story, complicated stuff. But I am curious when you first heard about 
the sort of people that I was looking for, just people that would be willing to talk about their past and their divorce and all that stuff. Was it an excited reaction? Like, hey, this is God has called me for this to minister to people about divorce and to speak for people who have gone through divorce? Or was it like, oh, I should probably do this, but I'm nervous. Like, what were y'all's, what were y'all's thoughts? Like, how do y'all feel right now? Y'all pretty nervous? Cause y'all don't, y'all don't look, y'all are doing a great job, by the way. You don't look nervous. You don't sound nervous, but how do you feel right now, Scott? Feel good. Yeah. I feel good. I, I think at first it was really had to think about, you know, what is God up to now? And, and I've tried to be really more open to saying yes to things like this. Because I know God's in the middle of it, and it's a topic that's important to me. Um, working as as part of the leadership of the divorce care program has just been so rewarding for me to really be able to give back. And you know, God has a sense of humor. Um, I never thought that He would use two divorces that I've gone through as as a, a means to as a spiritual gift to really be able to pour back into others. And Noel and I just see the, the the healing process that that these folks go through, and so yeah, at first it was it was a little bit of a what's up, what's God up to now, and then once um once I got over that, it was like yeah, you know, sign me up. Yeah, 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 and I and I want to say I, I want I'm curious what you guys think about these sentiments. Like I've often thought of how unfortunate it is in my opinion and maybe this has not been y'all's experience but it seems like anytime we want marital advice or people working in marriage ministry it's like well I'm not going to ask you guys y'all y'all aren't even married anymore where I think there is no way that you guys can't come to the table with just as much good advice good suggestions about marriage Y'all were married too, and half marriages, if not more, end in divorce. That doesn't mean that 51% of people have nothing good to say about marriage. Like, it is kind of crazy. It seems like you guys, well, we don't want y'all talking about marriage. Y'all can talk about divorce, but what do y'all have to say? Do y'all ever feel like people wouldn't want to talk to y'all about marriage stuff because you didn't have a successful marriage? Because I don't see it that way at all. I think y'all have just as much to bring to the table. I don't know that I... I think I don't have things to offer or that I feel like I don't have things to offer to uh, people about marriage. But um, it, re- it made me laugh because it reminds me, of, I was a marketing major in college and my uh, senior year, I took this advertising class and it was taught by the product brand manager of New Coke in the 90s. Huge failure, lost millions of dollars. But he opened up by saying, I was completely in charge of the biggest marketing failure in history. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to teach you what not to do right? and what you should All do. Right. So listen to people who have been through divorce because we can tell you what we did, what will not work, what, I mean, uh, obviously people know, but we have a lot of good advice to say and to give. And I think one of the benefits of being on this side is that we're not doing it from a place of self-righteousness or haughtiness Uh, or like we know more than you do. It's like we have been in that dump, the dumpster fire of divorce. We know it's gross, but God's hands it somewhere in it. And like when you were asking earlier if you were excited or nervous, I was so excited Mm -hmm. to be able to talk about this because I feel like Seacoast is great at reaching out to where people are. And that's a, if we're the church and we're the hands and feet of Christ, we meet people where they are. You don't need to have it all together. You don't need to be in church every Sunday and have your children singing out of hymnals. And you don't need all of that. We we go, we find you, we will meet you where you are in addiction or divorce or um, you know poverty. We find those people. And I think this is the divorce care ministry is a perfect example of how Seacoast has been so committed to meeting people where they're at and loving them where they're at and saying, you are good. You are whole. God loves you. God still has a plan for you. And divorce doesn't change that. Yeah, It might alter the direction of how you thought you were going to get there, but it doesn't change the fact that you have a purpose. Right. All right. That's awesome. That's awesome. 
All and right, I was I'm, the more terrified one. Yeah, I'm gonna throw you yeah. under the bus. You admitted to <laughs> yeah, being nervous, yeah, but yeah, hey, did. you're doing awesome. No, I'm 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 gonna be honest. And I was more terrified after I realized out in the lobby that these two knew each other and led a divorce care class together. <laughs> because I thought, well, why am I here? You could just have a podcast with these two, and, and so I'm I'm feeling a little like a third wheel. No, like, why, not at all. But, but I also believe that God has a purpose for each of our stories, and I am remarried now, and and my. My marriage now is healthier than anything I could have ever asked for or imagined. But none of that would have been possible. And my husband and I reflect on this all the time. Yeah. It would not have been possible without the failures that we had before because we learned so much about ourselves, about what we wanted, what we didn't want, what we probably should have known before we started the marriage process. Yeah. Um, so I, f- I feel like um, there are going to be some things that maybe I can share from my story oh, sure. today that, that can help. But I was a little intimidated when I realized <laughs> they knew each other. I thought, great, I'm going to be even more nervous. But I'm actually not. You guys are doing a great Good. job of, <laughs> of um, you know, just bringing it all to, to normalcy this morning. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. No, for sure. I'm glad you're yeah. here. Yeah. So I, I'll, I'll say this. It may sound weird at first, but it's because I obviously hope that you haven't had to experience anything worse. But I'll say is divorce the worst thing that you've gone through? I hope it is because I hope there wasn't anything else in your life that you'd say, man, it was even worse than the divorce. But divorce the worst thing you've ever gone through? Definitely the most traumatizing. Most traumatizing. Thing. It's pretty painful. Yeah. 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 It is. And you maybe had something I can tell by your reaction. Maybe you've had something. Well, the the time of my the timing of my divorce was timed where I had like multiple things yeah. happening at once. <laughs> so I guess the divorce was that probably season pretty, though. That season was the most traumatizing. Yeah. 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 Yeah, for sure. All right. So probably the biggest challenge that you have today sitting at this table is to give your give our listeners a snapshot of your story going into the marriage and just know that you'll have opportunities to follow up because I'm going to be asking follow-up questions. So it's not like you have to get it all out and, and, and the first stab, but just kind of give us a little snapshot of your, your story, Kelly. Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess I'm going to go ahead and share this. I've only about a handful of people know that I've actually been divorced twice. Also, Mm -hmm. most people only think I've been divorced once and that's okay. Um, the first marriage was to my high school boyfriend. Um, we got married after college. It lasted about seven or eight months. He was an alcoholic. And again, it's not even really worth talking about, but just to to shed light, that's when I got the Michael Morris call. It was the day after he left. And so to me, that was just a, a moment that that it did matter. It wow. did matter. That and, call. And you were in your late teens, like I was, 19? I was 21. Gosh. 21. That's ah, sweet. Yeah. That's and cool. so I didn't remarry until I was in my late 20s to um, my boy's father. And we ha- I have two boys with him. And I guess that's why I said earlier, when you don't really work on yourself and you don't really um, work on your relationship with God before you enter into a marriage, you're just going to kind of be thrown in to the to the world's view of things. And I was ready to settle down. I was at that age where I was ready to have a family. And so everything sounded great and looked right. But um, it became evident to me after, especially after having children, that um, the person I had married was not who I thought I had. Um, A lot of verbal, emotional, financial abuse. And when it became more physical, that's when I um, I left. Gotcha. And uh, so... And did you see any red flags before? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think... And you just didn't want to believe or... I didn't. And I know some of the the things that you told us to kind of think about before we came today. um, I was given an opportunity to have counseling with the pastor. And even the pastor looked at us and said, you know, you say the sky is blue, Kelly, but he says the sky is green. He hears you saying it differently. And the two of you really need to work on communication. And I thought, yeah, okay, whatever. You think you know a lot more than the people who are trying to, to pour into your life now. Yeah. And so, you know, you can choose to take that advice and work on things, or you can choose to just keep going and think you know more. And I, I think we just kind of were ready to to do our own thing. And there, so there were a lot of red flags even after we got married, um, leading up to the marriage. So, yeah, and you choose yeah. to see what you want to see, I think, yeah. sometimes. So really sorry to hear uh, about especially the uh, abuse. So how long was the marriage? Five years. Five years, yep. and was abuse throughout pretty much the whole thing. No, it, um, if you you know, looking back, you can see where, uh, and I was probably my worst self. So I I always I always want to make sure I, I say that you know I, I feel that I had a part in 
in the marriage too, not, not being successful. I'm um, looking back because I, I became my worst self when I was around someone who I was always feeling defensive around. So I'm sure I wasn't the greatest wife, but the Would verbal... you say that's true in most cases? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I would absolutely. agree. Absolutely. I would agree. Yeah. yeah. So, so the verbal part was, um, was probably evident throughout the emotional pieces. The financial part started to happen in the last few years. And then the physical was just in the last few months. Yeah. I think that I think that he knew that if that happened I would leave. Yeah. And so that was very carefully not not a part of it until it was. Right. And so that was my signal to to go because to me, you know, your children, everything that I did, every decision I made was about protecting them. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's it's sometimes I'll be with really close friends who I can talk real deep vulnerable things and I mean it's like um with with my marriage, for instance, I can open up about that, and I am appreciative the times when they can push back and say, "Well, what's what are you contributing?" And it's like mm-hmm. there'll be sometimes where I'm just like yeah. kind of pouring my heart out, and and she this and she that, and then I'll almost <laughs> always wrap up the conversation. But yeah. Lord knows I brought some stuff into this yeah. situation too, like, and I I just feel like it's it's not healthy to discard that. But there's probably situations where that is true, mm-hmm. where it's just like, look, I'm, I don't have anything to do with this, but it's probably rare. Yeah. Right, right. Thank yeah. you for sharing your story. Sure. Let's move on here to yeah, Noel. Definitely. I, um, I have a lot of the same kind of basic, uh, principles to mine. Uh, I, I met my ex-husband when we were 21. Um, I was a bartender and he was in the Navy. So till was all this time, <laughs> right? Um, I, we got married at 23. Uh, the day after we got married, um, we got married with like two weeks notice. I, I flew out to see him in Hawaii. He was stationed in Hawaii. I came back and I was like, mom and dad, I'm getting married when he comes home for Christmas. So I don't know. I don't like want to do a wedding or anything. We're just going to go to the courthouse. My mom pitched a fit. She threw a wedding with 10 people, like just my grandparents, mm-hmm. my parents, his parents. Um, we got married, moved to Hawaii the next day. Um, and it was within uh, four days of moving to Hawaii that I discovered a porn addiction. And uh, that was just kind of the first sort of cracks in um, who I thought I was marrying. Um, there was alcoholism, um, just kind of a dependence on um, work, uh, workaholic for sure. Um, kind of every chance that he got to choose someone over myself and our children. He did. Um, there was infidelity. Um, and it's all it, when I say it all now, or when I think back now, that's not even then who I still thought I was married to. I still thought I was married to just the person that I loved who had flaws like we all do. But now once God gives you some separation from that, you can process. And that's why we talk about it a lot in divorce care. It's so important to have space and time for healing. Like you said, you waited years before you ever remarried because hurt people hurt people. Um, My ex-husband was hurt. I was hurt leaving that marriage. Um, And yeah, I, it, it, develops into this monster Mm -hmm. that you can't believe is your life. Uh, I remember things happening, a physical outburst and holes being punched in walls and things being thrown and, and just thinking, this isn't my story. This happens to other people. This doesn't happen to me. My dad was a pastor. My parents have been married for 40 years almost. My grandparents were married for 60 years. I knew good love. I knew good, happy marriages. Um, And I think that is uh, the best thing that I can look back on and say that came from my divorce because all of that led back to me thinking that I had control. Yeah, I, I am a recovering control freak. I learned in divorce that I can control nothing. Is that uh, what broke you of it, you think? Oh, absolutely. From, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I like things planned. I like knowing where I'm going. And I had a, I checked boxes. And yeah. I, I, my ex-husband was good on paper. He checked these boxes. He did these things. Um, you did a Venn diagram before I you got did married. These things. <laughs> yes, I did these things. I should get, if I do A and B, it should equal C. 
And that's not how the way God works, number one. It's not the way the world works, and it's not the way anything works if you're dealing with another fault, flawed right. human. Right. So I, yeah, I, it, it was a crazy story, yeah. but also it's not. It's the world. It's yeah. the world we're living in, and it's those influences that kind of seep their way into something that's holy and good and given to us as a gift. Mm -hmm. do, have you guys ever said or thought, I was deceived? Like, do y'all think of your ex-husband as a deceiver, like purposely deceiving you? How many times can I say deceiving? Deceiving, deceiving, <laughs> deceiving. I don't know. I, I felt like I had blinders on too. So I, I hate to say that he deceived me because I wanted marriage and I wanted that family and I wanted what I thought I was getting. So um, I don't I don't like to place all the blame on him because I feel like I had a lot of responsibility in it too. Gotcha. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I think I think the world deceives us. Yeah. I, I think that uh, it wasn't them. It was... Mm -hmm. I want what I want mm -hmm. the white yep. picket fence. I want, I want the house and two point five kids and the dog mm -hmm. and and you find somebody that you think matches those yeah. requirements that you've made for yourself and you're like, this is about the right time, I think. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. I agree with her. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. And the, the whole childbearing age thing yes. was, was playing a part because you know, the world says you have to have kids before a certain right. age. And so all of those things, again, the world. I, yeah. I one hundred percent agree yeah. with what she's saying. Uh, yeah. What's your story? Oh, wow. But you only have 10 seconds. Go. Yeah, I know. We took, I know. Too long, sorry. <laughs> took way too much time. Um, my first marriage, we got married right out of college. I mean, it was just totally way too quick. And all the, all the wrong reasons to get married, really. Um, everybody else's friends were getting married. So it was like, okay, well, we should get married too. That marriage lasted 10 years. We didn't have a, any children. And, and basically the, the last several years of the divorce, it became more um, alcohol-related, um, and I just, we just decided that let's, let's just go our separate ways, and it was, it was for the best, really. Um, she moved out of town. She wanted to go back to Charlotte. I didn't want to leave Charleston, and unfortunately, um, about a year or so later, she passed away of oh, alcoholism. Wow. wow. Um, I moved right into another relationship, um, almost like a rebound. Didn't take the time of healing like we now know that's important with uh, divorce care. We really emphasize that a lot. Around that was when in my mid twenties. Yeah. Oh yeah. So you, you didn't know. know what you were doing. I mean, what nobody did in their twenties. <laughs> you know, like, you know, I, my my son. I was um, forty when my son was born. Gotcha. Um, the second marriage was seventeen years. Um, lady from Indiana, um, she wanted to, we, we just grew apart. There wasn't any, we both made contributions to, to the divorce, to the, the challenges that we were having. Um, culturally, we're a little bit different. Um, we got to the point where uh, I think we just both ended up with hardened hearts and we started to abandon each other in terms of the relationship. And it got to the point it was it just continued to get worse to the point where um, the, the idea of divorce was presented and we ended up going down that path. The biggest casualty of the divorce is, is the children. And I only have one, that son, 21 years old, um, they ended up moving to Indiana. I uh, felt that was probably the best thing for them, her, her little small town. And my son did not particularly like Wando High School. And so I, I gave them the opportunity to move to Indiana. But it cost me uh, a lot with in terms of my relationship with my son. And that's my really biggest regret mm -hmm. when it comes to that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, no I, I could understand that for sure. I'm curious when you guys, let's say, are talking to someone on an airplane and you're just chit-chatting a little bit and they're just like, you know, I'm divorced, my current spouse, blah, blah, blah. Is there like a all of a sudden something goes off in your heart or like they get me in certain ways that people who did not go through a divorce could not? Like, is there like this thing in your head to where it's like, we have something in common that only we can understand? 
Yeah, it happens. And, yeah. It's definitely it's it's a for the guys. It's a fraternity, right? I, it's, I, I, you know, the, I, the girls. I, it's, it's funny. A sorority. I, it's, it's funny. Yeah. I have the. You can attest. I have those words right there. But it's saying fraternity. It kind of feels like that. Yeah. It, it does. Yeah. Y'all would say the same thing. Yes. Maybe early on. Um, yeah, I don't you're like know. I don't want to be in that sorority. Yeah, <laughs> it was something that I had such a such a shroud of shame over me after it happened because I felt like such a failure, especially the second time. And, I, and that's why yeah. I never told people I had been divorced before because um, my life when I moved to Somerville um, from Mount Pleasant, it was kind of like starting over, and nobody really knew my story, mm-hmm. and so I only told a handful of people. But um, over time, I've learned that it isn't something to be ashamed of. And it's right. certainly a part of my story that I've been able to use to to help other people through difficult circumstances. But I don't, I don't know. I Maybe I did in the beginning, but now it's more of a, um, it's been, maybe it's been so long since I went through my divorce. It's been about 18 years for me. So I'm a little farther out mm-hmm. that I feel more like when I hear it, it, it almost makes me go, oh, but wait, there's so many more options. Like, let's not talk about divorce. You know, so I, I, I guess... When I hear about divorce, I just want to hear somebody's story. Like you're, you know, I wanted to know right. what happened to the two of you. So it's more of a compassion that I feel than a camaraderie. Yeah. I don't know how. I don't know no, how to describe it. I don't know how to describe it. But that it's more sense. of a dang it, you two. Let's talk up. You know, let's let's yeah. hear what happened to you. And I yeah. agree. Yeah, it's kind of like you want to know what phase they're in of yeah, divorce. Like, right. are you right in the middle of the gross yeah. stuff? Uh, yeah. Are yeah. you like in your Angry. healing process? <laughs> Did you ever heal? Are you just like hard and mm-hmm. bitter? And um, mm-hmm. where are you at? Because I've been in those places too. Mm-hmm. And um, it's kind of, if they're in a good spot, it's encouraging. It's like, yeah, we're doing it. Yeah. Um, and if it's not, it's like, wait, there's some other stuff here you need to handle before mm-hmm. you jump into back into the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, th- yep. and I almost think sometimes when you come from a divorced family, um, and I know you said you, a lot of you had some good experiences. My grandparents were married, you know, their entire lives into their nineties um, and before they passed away. But my, my, because my parents divorced, I think there was a part of me because I was a teenager and you know so much more than your parents that I thought, well, they couldn't make it work, but I will never go through that. You know, that, that's that dangerous never word. Well, it ended up becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy because I was desperately trying so hard to make things work that I was making poor choices and not preparing myself the right ways. Um, instead of really, you know, not seeing them as that, that, that person that didn't try hard enough or whatever you were saying, Joey, I think that unfortunately that might've been a little bit of my perspective back then. And also a lot of the TV shows and things, divorcees were always that woman who dressed all, you know, attractive with a low right. shirt and lots of lipstick. And, and I don't know why um, they were seen sort of as a, a vixen or somebody who was out to get somebody else's husband or something like that. Sometimes I felt like that was uh, a stereotype yeah. that, mm-hmm. you know, if you were divorced, you were looking for someone, you know, mm-hmm. for someone all the time. And that that was not true. Gotcha. <laughs> well, I'm sure you guys can attest. Yeah. Sometimes you really just wanted to be you for a while and you're not in a relationship. And um, I don't know. So yeah. that, that might be a stereotype that I yeah. felt. Yeah. I think that uh, another thing about seeing healthy marriages or like grandparents and parents is my parents did have a healthy marriage, but I had associated staying married to successful marriage. And that is not always the case. I thought if you stayed married, that meant your marriage was successful. And that's not, uh, I could have stayed married. I could. My husband probably never would have left me. But it wouldn't have been successful, and I don't think it would have been the covenant that God created to have for me or anyone else. Yeah. 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 So it sounds like, if I'm keeping up with all your stories accurately, all of you experienced a divorce while in a religious environment, Mm -hmm. your church community sort of thing. Did that compound the difficulty and almost feeling like you have a scarlet letter. And I would say, I think that a long time ago, like in the 80s and 90s, I mean, we saw divorce as almost like you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You just right. don't do it. Whereas now, I believe we're in a healthier place of just don't judge people. You don't know their story. You don't know anything that's going on. And grace can cover anything. Absolutely. You know, grace can absolutely cover anything. But I don't know, how, how do you guys feel about that as far as, did you, did that make things harder? Like, okay, now, not only did my marriage, did, did I fail in my marriage, I'm using that in quotations, but 
I'm, it's happening in a church environment. Did that make it harder? I think it only made it harder from my own point of view. I, I beat myself up so much because I knew better. I knew better. It was, I, I could have done better. I could have chosen my spouse better. It was all me. It wasn't the church. I did not feel, I was at the time I was involved in a church in Kentucky, Seven Hills. Um, and it was an incredible church, a living church like Seacoast. And I felt welcome there. I felt included. I didn't feel ostracized. But in my head, I definitely, which is, I mean, the devil puts those thoughts in your head because nothing is better for us than a Christian community. If he can cut you off from that, that, I mean, part of most of his work's already done. Um, so no, I, I do not feel that way from the church. I think that the church has come a long way in loving people where they're at. Um, so you, you would agree with my sentiments that it, yes, it's, that absolutely. It, it used to be something that absolutely. you're being too judgmental. Yes. Like yes. You, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that that's not the case anymore. And I'm so thankful for it because there's so much healing that can come. And that's exactly what you need. You need that encouragement. You need that, the presence of other believers around you. Cause if not, then other people are going to fill that void. Right. And, and I believe that narrow mindedness of, okay, you're just not trying hard enough for sure kept people in very unhealthy marriages that Absolutely. they didn't need to be in. Like, for example, a woman choosing to be abused over getting out of the marriage that's Absolutely. not safe for her. You know, how yeah. about you? How, did you? Did you feel an added level of, of you know, trouble because of your context being in a church? We, I mean, we, we came to church every week. And, and the, the, the thing about the message that the church provides is God loves us despite our circumstances. And he doesn't say when you have difficulties, he says, or if, you, if you're going to have difficulties, he says when you have difficulties. So for, for me, it was always just reconciling back to uh, God's word and, and realizing that, you know, life is not easy. Divorce is just one of those circumstances. It's not excluded from the difficulties we're going to have in life. And I never felt like the, the church was judging me any different because I was going through divorce versus um, the, the, a long-standing marriage. And, and I, I always saw that in the church, even Pastor Greg one time really invited the, the congregation to submit questions. And a lot of those questions he would just answer during a, a sermon. And a lot of them were related to divorce and, and, and marriage. And he was always so uh, warm with his, his feedback. And it was never, you know, you're, you're going to be shamed or guilted if you go down that path. He just always made us realize that we were always going to continue to be loved and cared for despite whatever our, our situation. Mm -hmm. So never felt like I would be alienated from that. Yeah. Sounds like all of y'all had pretty good experiences with church family during your divorce. I mean, Definitely. does that sound about right? Because yeah. that's not always It's a unique the church. Case. There's no doubt yeah, about you're it. you're right. I wasn't I mean, at Seacoast when I was right. going through the divorce, so I was in an Episcopal church. What was great was the pastor met with us, and he was like, I, I feel like there's this volcano about to erupt in, in your husband. And so— it was identified, but there was no support like what you all uh, offer in the, the divorce care and all that. There was nothing. It was like, yes, we can identify it, but there was no, here's how we can support you and help you where you're at. And so moving to Somerville was was something that happened next. Um, th when um, the separation happened, I knew that I could go back to Seacoast because there had always been that uh, that open door Right. feeling about the church. And I wish I could say that that I um, I drew closer to God at first, but I kind of fell back into an unhealthy relationship with someone else. And so I was going to church every Sunday and hearing this life-giving message and then going and having this secret relationship that I didn't want to share with people because it was safe, because this person made me feel safe in that abusive situation and, and the divorce and all of that. And I knew it was wrong. Um, but I never felt condemned. Now, there was a lot of messages that spoke right to my heart, um, but I was sort of living this like double life for a while. And 
there was finally this message and it was about love and it was love is patient, love is kind. And I remember thinking, this is not what I'm doing. Like this relationship is not any of these things. And so I just prayed like, God, just if this isn't the relationship I need to be in, you know, testing him, just, just end it. Right. That's the only time I can say that the prayer was answered the very next day. The person that I was dating who we would never fight, we were great friends, um, called me and ended the relationship over the phone. And I remember just shaking, going, okay, God, wow, I guess Lord. this is what yeah. you want me to Prayer do. Prayer works, man. It was crazy. And so I know at the beginning of this podcast, we got to share something really cool, and I didn't get to share mine yet. So this oh, is yeah, mine. Yeah. So this is mine. So the man that I'm married to now was also listening to that message at Seacoast Church, was also in a relationship with someone else, and they ended their relationship that day. Wow. Oh, my goodness. And we did not meet each other for about eight months after that, but we wow. were both serving at Seacoast Somerville. I was on the worship and tech team. He was on the worship and tech team. And later we ended up meeting, but it was not until we had both submitted completely to God and said, this is what I'm doing wrong. (laughs) Just wash me clean of it. And like we, um, we were just focused on our, our children and on, on the father. And it wasn't until we made that submission, that complete submission that we met each other. And even then it was just this friendship that was immediate, you know, yeah. but, but I say all this to say that was my cool story. I have a seacoast romance, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, from serving and just being genuine, just being genuine and finally authentic and who I was and not being ashamed of it. And like the very first time I, we met for our first date, I told him everything. Like, this is what's happened in my life. This is what I did about it. This is in it. And and to just be able to be authentic and finally myself was just freeing. Yeah. It was just freeing. Yeah. You know, That's so that cool. was my cool story. I love, great. I love it. I thought That's it would great. eventually yeah. come up. But, that um, sounds like a, a romance novel, a seacoast love oh, story. Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's write That's it. Good. <laughs> I'm That's not good. a good writer, but you've got a marketing degree. Maybe we can figure this out. Yeah. That's what we Scott. <laughs> I, I just want to say that, you know, with divorce care, we really let them know that d- divorce does not define who you are. You know, and 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 there's a lot of transparency in that and freedom. So to, many people need to hear that. I bet. Mm. You know, it's, I could imagine needing to hear that. We're not walking was. around with a label saying I'm divorced. You know, it's it's a mindset that we really instill in them that they can regain their confidence, they can grow and heal, and 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 live live out life just like the rest of it of the community. You know, it's so. Um, we don't wear that label and it's, it's, we hope to give them that freedom to know that. Yeah. How do you feel about these sentiments? Do you think it accurately describes a lot of Christian type thought? Oh, so there was adultery. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, so there was abuse. Gotcha. No adultery or abuse. Whoa. So y'all just gave up? Like, Is that kind of a thing? Because I think people check the boxes like, oh, adultery, oh, abuse. But if if you got a divorce and it was outside of those two reasons, it's like, well, wait a second now. You needed one of those. (laughs) That's a conversation that uh, we we sometimes have to have. Yeah. Um, We see a lot of um, we see a lot of experiences um, that people are going through that end up in divorce. Um, I, I think back to Ephesians chapter 5, and, and I think about where God really sets expectations for the, the relationship between a husband and a wife. And when he does that, he talks about uh, submissions, attitudes, behaviors, um, the, the, the relationship from a, a, a sexual standpoint, what the expectations are. And in my mind, what happens a lot of times is is there's a breakdown in the relationship that leads to the the hardening of the heart that you can't get beyond sometimes. And and breaking that down sometimes can't be done, and you end up in separation and divorce. Um, That doesn't fit the mold in terms of the qualifications in terms of getting a divorce, but it's real. It's real pain, and some of that, some of that time, some of the times, you just can't overcome that um, abuse. You know, safety is is definitely a conversation we have a lot, but we just just don't want to play the judgment card because we're not in their shoes. We've experienced some of the same things, but you know, it's 
just top of mind. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I actually remember, and Seacoast, we say, is a big tent, and so there's there's people with different perspectives on different things. So this isn't like a Seacoast-backed opinion necessarily, but it was a pastor that was on staff here, and I was very new as a pastor, and I remember there was a marriage in which one a, a woman was married to a man that had just pretty much checked out. Like, he's kind of like, I just, I don't have it in, in me anymore. But had she just left things alone, she would have stayed married with him forever because he was kind of complacent and was just like, I'll live here, you know, and just not. Yeah. And I'll never forget asking this pastor, I was just like, I just don't think it'd be good for her just to stay in this relationship when her, her husband's not being anything to her. And, and he said, he pointed to the teachings in Corinthians where basically it says something about an unbeliever, which in this case, it wasn't an unbelieving husband. But if an unbeliever is willing to stay, then you stay with them. He's just like, Joey, he may be physically there, but he's not staying in that marriage. He has, he has left that marriage. Yes. And so for her to stay in that situation, it's, it's kind of taking on like some abusive behavior. And I think that a really good reminder for ourselves is there are certain situations where we can keep some, we can keep someone in our life and we can, love ourselves, which is important. We need to love ourselves. Or I'm sorry, we can love that person that we're keeping in our life, but we can't love ourselves because we have this person in our life, which is a very unloving thing. But we can figure out how to love someone from afar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we can love ourselves and someone from afar, but there are certain times where you can love someone, maybe if they're in your living space sort of thing, but you can't love yourself while that person is in your living space, you know? Right, right. And I, I also think that you're point brings up that there's different types of uh, abandonment. You know, there's physical abandonment, there's emotional abandonment, there's physical abuse, emotional abuse. Um, and I, I think all of that addiction, um, adultery, all of these things are things that were not created in God's holy covenant of marriage. When you enter a marriage with a believer, it's two people saying, we're making this promise to each other, but also a promise to God. And when one or both of them break that covenant, I don't think you can even, um, you know, it doesn't, it's not the same sort of measurement anymore. If somebody checks out, somebody breaks their covenant with God, you're kind of out on your own. I mean, right. you have your covenant intact with God. Um, and then you just have to pray. I, 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 I remember sitting in church and praying every single Sunday, please, please, God, restore my marriage. Take these addictions from him. Please bring us peace to our home, peace to our children, peace to our marriage. Restore it because God loves restoration stories. Um, and the pastor that day said, if you feel like you've been praying the same prayer over and over and it's not being answered, maybe you're praying the wrong prayer. And so I sat down during worship time. And I said, if I'm not supposed to be in this, please, overwhelming, give me an overwhelming sense of peace with the idea that I have to walk away. And from that day on, I knew what I was going to do. I felt it just wash over me. And I knew that God was with me and he was going to walk with me through that. Was all of it great and hunky-dory? No, it was gross and awful and painful and like losing a limb. Um, it's but, like a death, right? Yeah. But that person is still alive. Yeah. I've heard somebody say that. It is like a death, except, and, and this is just one person, it's harder because there's no closure in that death because they're there, also, especially they if there's kids involved. they can hurting you sure. or your children. And their actions oh gosh, keep yeah. reverberating in your life. And you're like, wait. I, wait. I cannot imagine the difficulty in having kids with someone that you had to divorce like for your own like health safe but your safety yeah. but you're connected with them forever because they're the parent of your kids like you like they're they're like I've had the ability to cut myself off of people that I did not think were good to have in my life you don't get that shot you no. don't get that option if there's kids involved that's no. oh my gosh and that's the worst be is that you have to really like get every bit of self control you have and filter what you're saying in front of them or about mm -hmm. their parent. 
Um, and that, I mean, that is a ongoing lesson in patience and humility and love. Right. Because, even when there's someone feels so unlovable. Right. Because for the kid, you don't want them to have animosity for their other parent because that's not good for the kid. But then at some times there's probably human points where you're just like, I just want you to know what I'm actually dealing with because then you'd understand what your mom's going through. <laughs> right, well, right. Yeah, that depends on their age. Yeah. yeah. And you know, the older they are, the, the, the more they understand and they see it themselves. Yeah. You're, she's dealing with young children mm-hmm. and, and that's even more difficult in my mind is in a situation where there's been abuse, allowing the visitation, even sometimes unsupervised, right? Mm-hmm. That's 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 just a hard situation to to really let go and trust God. Yeah, completely. Oh, at prayers of protection <laughs> fly in all the time. Yeah, and and you're right. You you have to their age. I have a seven and a nine year old. Both little boys. And their dad, they look up to him. He hung the moon. And I, I love that they can see him through that lens. I love that. But unless things change, they're going to keep getting older and they're going to see without that lens of childhood innocence soon. And I don't want that to come from me. Mm-hmm. I, I want that to come from them and what, what yeah. they see. Yeah. yeah. No, that's, that's, that's wisdom that I think I'll, that's, short supply a lot of times in these situations. It's hard. Like I, I've, 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 I've seen family situations in my extended family where one person poisoned the waters for their kids and even made uh, his or her kids scared of their mom or dad when they had nothing to be afraid of and they grew up being afraid. And nothing I mean, it's like, good comes from exactly. that. Exactly. How happens, can that be good? Happens way too often. I know. Right. Yeah. I don't think kids should be... Um, should be a part of the parents' emotional right, turmoil. Right. And I feel like um, that's the time that I had to rely on God the most. I, I honestly can say I, the prayers of protection over the boys um, after the supervised visitation was over and they were unsupervised after that first year, it was um, a, just a lot of prayer, a lot of tears. But I always believe that you know God loves them even more than I do which was crazy to me because I loved those boys so much. But it was like, yeah, but he loves them more. And so that protection was there. And, you know, now they're both adults <laughs> and they're they're thriving. But it is confusing for a lot of the years that they would come home and have questions. And, and I always just um, kept the conversation positive about their father because I always wanted them to create that environment and to have that relationship that they built. Um, you don't always get that honesty and trust from the other side. But um, over time, I can honestly say that that protection was there. I, and I can look back now because it's been 18, 19 years. But in the, in the time, the turmoil and the stress and all of that was, was horrible. But it was worth every, every bitten tongue. Every time I bit my tongue or every time I just smiled through it and just, you know, held back the things that I wanted to say, the things that, that I deserved. You know, you, you're like, but I deserve to have justice and I deserve. no. I mean, God didn't, Jesus didn't deserve what he got, you know, and I'm not trying to compare myself to Jesus. I'm simply saying there's going to be pain, but we're not alone in the pain. Um, I always felt like that peace of God was with me and, um, and in the, and we're still going through it. I mean, I'm still the, I'm sure the boys still have things that they're going to have to work through that they've heard and seen. And, but I truly believe that, um, that, that the children, can have very healthy, normal lives even through what they've been Absolutely. through. Absolutely. You know, yeah. but that prayer is very important. I will never diminish the power of prayer. I know my grandmother, if you told a crazy story about her, I don't have one, but I know she prayed for me every single day and she prayed for those kids Great every memory. single day. Yeah. Worst, worst so. part for you too, I know Scott said the kids, the, the, your your yeah. son, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. right? Worst part for him when it comes to the divorce, same thing, has got to be the kids seeing them suffer. For you oh, guys. absolutely. 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 A, a, another kind of unspoken um, hurt that comes along with divorce is I loved my in-laws. I was, I was I loved yep. my in-laws. I loved their family. It was a big family. Like we had big Christmases. Oh, and, yeah. And I lost that too. Mm-hmm. And that was a big blow because not only did I feel like I was losing my partner, but I was losing that whole side. And it's 
And grieving that is something different because, I don't know, you, you when we marry someone, we marry their families. It's one big joining of people and usually it's surrounding the holidays or birthdays and fun stuff. And I remember the first year that we had Christmas after we separated and it was so heavy. I, I, it was the first year that I sent my children away on the 26th and they went to go have Christmas with the family that used to be mine too. Um, and just so many, we talk about in divorce care, um, the, the tapes that play the negative tapes, negative tapes that play in our heads. And I was like, they're all, once the kids go to bed, they're all going to talk about me. And they're, I mean, they're ripping me apart right now. And it would just make me physically ill. Yeah. Cause that's their little boy, you know, that's yeah, like, that's, that's our son. Even if you, even if you, I would like to think that my two little boys, I could see if they had faults in their marriage. I would like to think that, <laughs> but you don't know, you know, you don't know. It, it was their child. Right. And I understand fiercely defending your child. So, and their child was hurt. I mean, he was hurt when our marriage ended too. Um, and all and all too often the kids will feel like they're they're at the at fault, you know. Yeah. Did you know they think did I cause this divorce to happen yeah. between mom and dad? Yeah. And you have to be really quick to to diffuse that. Yeah. yeah. You you guys may not have had this sort of setup, but in situations, and so this may be you know guesswork for you guys, but in situations in which uh, a married couple shares the same friend group, do you think that both of them are going to need at least a friend or two that says, I see your perspective, I see your side, I still love her or him, you know, your spouse that you're going through a divorce with, but I got your back, she's in the wrong or he's in the wrong, or would it just be like if, if, like if I'm a friend and I'm seeing my friends get a divorce, is it always best just to say, I love you both, I'm impartial? Because I would imagine sometimes you kind of need a person to say, I, I got you, you know, I, I, I got your back. Divorce care provides that. Yeah. I, I mean, we, we have men and women in the same class, but the men really come together, the women come together, and we really encourage that. Um. And you need that. You need somebody that is going through the similar experience. And sometimes, you know, we talk about, I said, the fraternity. Yep. There are p- people that will come to you and befriend you to help you and, and be by your side to go through that. You always need a 2, 2 a.m. person. Who are you going to call at 2 a.m.? You need that kind of person that's going to stand there with you and no, no matter what the circumstance. I also think it's really important if you are a friend of a couple who is getting divorced and you are friends with both, it's very important to try to stay impartial. Even if someone's blatantly doing something wrong, you can just pray for them and say, I know you're grieving. Let me grieve with you. I mean, it's nobody really needs that ammo in divorce. It's already so heated and so, um, you know, just touchy anyways. Sometimes if you're with a friend going through that and you're like, yeah, you're right. Like I, I would leave him too, or I would leave her too. That's not the ammo that they need. That's not going to bring about good, healthy right. conversation in divorce. Um, it's just too touchy. It's yeah. like an explosive. So the more you can stay, yes, I'm grieving with both of you through this. Yes, I understand how you feel or I'm trying to. I see that you're hurting. I see that you're grieving. Um, and just kind of do it in that way instead of agreeing to the ammo. Right, right. And and they're uh, kind of taking a sharp turn here and we're wrapping this thing up. I mean, there's some tricky verses that I would imagine and feel free to go into some things about divorce care. But there has to be people, including maybe some of you guys at some point who come to you guys and say, I feel stuck. God hates divorce, and I'm reading where it says that if I get a divorce, then I'm committing adultery if I remarry, and uh, if, uh, you know, it's like I feel stuck. I don't know what to do because I can't get married because it's saying that I'm, I'm committing adultery, and, you know, in my head as a pastor, I would say, yeah, but look at these much larger, more applicable verses. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. So that can't mean I become a new creation and then I have to also fix things or I have to stop. No, you're brand new. 
A- another one that comes to mind is where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. So grace gets the final say, but there's some tricky territory in the Bible. There is. And that one specific verse you were talking about, the... Um, it, it, if you're if you leave your spouse and you get remarried, I I read a translation of that in uh, preparing for this, and it was um, if you leave if a husband leaves his wife um, in order to remarry, he is committing adultery. So I I feel like maybe the translation of that gotcha. is a little yeah. more friendly. Like it's you're committing adultery if, even if you just like break up with somebody so that you can marry somebody else, that's still adultery. You've still committed that lust in your heart and that that broken covenant. So, Yeah. Well, I, we are not paid counselors. We're not professionals. <laughs> I know it may seem like it. Yeah, it does. <laughs> we, we play one on TV yeah. and we play one on a podcast. Um, but in all seriousness, we, we are really quick to encourage and, and refer the folks that want to have a deeper conversation about that. Some people really do. We'll, we'll refer them to the pastoral team. Uh, it's great now that we have the counselor center, Pastor Michael. Um, no, I've known him for years. I know the good work that they're doing there. So referrals is, is part of our game when, when divorce care. But we don't try to judge them regardless of what their circumstances and their, their worries are. Um, as Noel said, um, there are a lot of scriptures out there that, that really support um, difficult, difficulties in life. And if you're there and you have the right purpose and your heart's in the right place, sometimes you can't avoid separation and divorce. Yep. We've heard some really horrible stories, and they don't necessarily check the box with, with some of the legalese when, you're talking about in terms of religion, right? Um, there's no way I would have stayed in numerous of those situations, um, and it's really sad to know that people are going through those types of. A lot of it really, the root is it gets back to the abuse yeah. item, and people are just selfish, right? And they do, and they make you know God gives us free will, and with that free will, sometimes we make really poor decisions. Yeah. And, you know, there's, there's consequences with every decision we make. And sometimes our decisions are just really not good, and they're harmful. And they're, they're, they just they, they create division within relationships. And sometimes words are just not good enough to overcome that. Um, and it's sad. Again, divorce is, God hates divorce. You know, he doesn't. We, we don't advocate divorce. And, it, and he hates it, though. And, and I always want to turn that scripture on its back in some degree because of where I came from in my religious cultures. He hates it because it hurts us. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. It's not like, I hate it, and how dare you? How can I can't believe you did that to me. It's, right. I hate it because I don't want to see you hurt. That's yeah. why he gives us the blueprint for a healthy marriage. Yeah. I, I'm trying to protect you. Yeah. Don't do this this way. But it, when people come to us in divorce care, or if they if they don't even make it to divorce care, but they're going through a divorce and they're plugging themselves into the church, it doesn't really matter what brought them there. Their reality is they're going through divorce. So our job as the church, as the hands and feet of Christ, right. is just to love them in it. Just and, be there. And recognize and, and, and let them know we, we know their hurt hurts. Yeah. I mean, we, we don't um, discount their hurt. It's important for us to recognize and help them understand that we're going to help them go through a grieving process. Yeah. And we're going to help them. That's our whole purpose with the divorce care is not to, we're not part of the reconciliation plan. If they want to pursue that, we're more than welcome to help them get in re-engage and all the programs that are available to them. But we just want to help them heal because we want them to leave the, the program in better shape than when they come in. We see it from week to week. It's so rewarding for us. We get chills watching people heal as they go through the, the program. Yeah. And when they come out of there, hopefully they're a little bit better equipped for their next relationship. We're not encouraging them to move right in because in some cases, we get people that come to us who have been divorced for two, three, four years. They just never had closure. 
And they finally realize that I need closure. I need to heal so that I can move forward. And when they sometimes try to move forward and they recognize I, things are just not right for me, the relationships are not working for me, it's because they haven't taken the time to step back and heal and go through an adequate uh, grieving process. Yeah. And at the end of the grieving process, I always add forgiveness. You've got to forgive yourself. You've got to like who you see in the in the mirror, and we really try to help reframe their their thinking. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a lot of fun to help people from a from a mind standpoint reset their minds right and think positively instead of all the negativity. Yeah, and I can see a huge part of what you guys do is that passage in the New Testament, I think maybe Paul, where he talks about the God of all comfort and the comfort that you guys received, y'all can extend the same thing. Y'all provide so much comfort, just the community and being Absolutely. able to talk to other people who's been through the same thing. I mean, it's got to be like fresh water on yeah. a hot summer day. God loves a redemption story, yeah. man. And uh, I think that... It I can speak for myself and probably for them too. Sometimes at the end of the divorce, you feel like, well, I mean, I don't have anything to add in a religious standpoint now. From a re religious standpoint, I I have failed the one thing that I thought I could do in my covenant with God. And it's so not true. And it's so, I Scott and I kind of have to, well, Scott's better at doing it than I am, but I kind of have to tone myself down sometimes in divorce care because I just want to be like, it gets so much better. It gets so much better. Don't give up. Keep going. Lean in. Lean into God. Lean into what He's got for you. Turn to Him in times of grief, in times of anxiety, in times of doubt. Lean in. Don't lean out. Lean in because something's going to fill up your mind. Something's going to fill up your time and be decisive on what you're going to let. In many cases, we have folks that, are, that don't even go to Seacoast. Yeah. That are, that are in the program, because yeah. it's a national program, and they pick it up off the internet, and they find out about the dates, and they show up, and they don't have any relationship with God. And that's one of the other beautiful parts of what we're doing, is we're introducing them to a bi bi biblical program, and then we introduce them to who God is. And we're seeing it, and it's so cool. We're we, seeing it right now. They end up in church. Mm -hmm. They they get so intrigued by wanting to know more, they end up in church, and then they go down front, and they get prayed on. These two ladies came back from two weeks ago, and they were just describing their experience. They just cried their eyes out. And then we asked them to share that experience in divorce care. And it just, everybody just gained so much from hearing those stories. We're just, we're just facilitators, yeah. really. yeah. Well, thank y'all, all three. Yeah. I really am appreciative just for you guys to sit here and share your story. I do want to close with a question I'm very curious about, and we'll just say true or false. When it comes to the divorce care ministry, do y'all ever have people coming that you ca start catching on? They're not here to heal from a divorce. They're trying to find a rebound. That's got to happen sometimes. <laughs> do y'all ever run into people where you're like, you're just trying to get a date? <laughs> Not directly, Not but there have, there have been some divorce care couples. I would say yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Was the answer yes or no? Yes it's or no. Okay, well, yes or no. Got to say yes. We do uh, very, very on the front end of the program, we have some guidelines, and we really say this is not a dating scene, um, and we're really adamant about that. I don't really think we've had any real situations. We've had some some participants who have become good friends and we just remind everyone if you're if you're married if you're still married then by by no means you can't have a relationship you're still married yeah if you're if you're beyond that you know just last night the class was last night a guy came and pulled me aside and he said well what about and I said look are you married or not he said yes I am I was like what well, this conversation's off the table. You shouldn't be pursuing an additional relationship at this point. And really, it, because of divorce care, if you're there, you're not healed. If right. you're there, you're actively working on healing yourself. And um, yeah. it, it's just, it takes some time. Just give yourself, it's like 12 or 13 weeks. You can, there you go. 
You can be single for twelve to thirteen weeks. <laughs> well, I know you're trying to. I know you're trying to wrap up, and I. I am first of all. I'm so excited that there are so many resources because that's something that I mentioned earlier about my story. I didn't feel like I had a resource, so you just go to what you know, which is another relationship, right? Um, so I love that that there are all these different resources, and I just wanted to mention that um, one thing that that I've been really passionate about for the last year that's been stirring in my heart is marriages that are struggling. Um, so not to the point where they're divorced, but like before they get to that point. And um, I know you mentioned Encouragers earlier, yeah. and that's a ministry that started over there, but we're actually starting that at Somerville Campus. Nice. Yeah. And so um, I'm, I'm not a counselor either. I am just someone who has a story who can just hear with different ears, mm-hmm. people that are struggling or that are in pain. And so um, that's a ministry that we're starting and I'm going to hopefully... Um, get to be a part of that's very great. soon. Cool. I think we just that's launched great. it this past Sunday. So um so the re- resources for people that are that are still married that really want to make it work or that aren't sure if they need counseling or if they are headed towards divorce and you know, just being able to plug them in. Somewhere. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Be yeah, a good listener. Yep. Yeah, we'll have all the links in the yeah. show notes to all yeah, these opportunities. Good stuff. Awesome. Thank y'all so much. Right. Thanks Joey. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Thanks Appreciate for having it. us. Thank you. You've been listening to the Things You Won't Hear on Sunday Seacoast Podcast. In the show notes, you'll see a link to our Facebook group page. Also, we'd love for you to consider subscribing so you get these episodes downloaded right when they come out. Thanks so much for listening.